Ladies and gentlemen who are watching us on Facebook and uh, LRT platform, dear students, it is my great pleasure and honor today to moderate a seminar which is organized by French Embassy in Lithuania, Institut Francais in Vilnius and Institute of International Relations and Political Science, Vilnius University. And this seminar is dedicated to a very interesting topic about the changing power balances and uh, what does it mean for Europe. And the topic of today's seminar is uh, Guerre Invisible, Invisible War. Worse, what should be done by the European Union, what European Union can do in this changing global environment. And before I will start the introduction of our guest, because we have a very prominent guest today with us, I'd like to give the floor to the Madam Ambassador of uh, French Embassy in Lithuania, Madam Claire Lignier Punat. Thank you very much, Margreta. Ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear students, dear all, uh, it's a pleasure for, for me today and with my colleagues to uh, welcome uh, Thomas Gomard. You will present him as uh, one of our leading experts in the field of international relations. And I think it's a new topic he will talk to us about today. And you mentioned the topic. Uh, Thomas Gomard has written a book about that recently. And he has uh, shown us uh, what will be the competition in the future, and it, all, and it is already taking place between powers, and uh, that uh, leads to this invisible war. So it's not so much something that we are uh, conscious about, it is taking place, uh, and we should um, look at it uh, uh, in Europe, because maybe Europe is not fully prepared to uh, to be part of the game and to defend itself. So if I understand there are these invisible wars between mainly United States and China in the field of innovation, uh, because when you want to tackle, uh, to fight against climate change, you need a lot of innovation in the field of um, access to data, because data is, an, is something very important in the competition uh, today and tomorrow in the economic competition. And probably Europe is a little bit lagging behind, not, not necessarily in its intellectual capacity, but it's in its uh, uh, analysis of the situation, in its willingness to reinforce its capacities, capabilities in the field of defense and intelligence. So we also believe in general in France that uh, Europe should act as a political actor in the field in this uh, to, to, to be able to defend its, its system, the political system, social system, uh, and to probably invest more in defense, in intelligence, and in uh, analysis of the situation. Because we think that uh, this autonomy of EU to act, to defend its system is what we call the, uh, strategic autonomy in a, in a way and the defense of European sovereignty, which is at the core of our uh, policy in, French, in France and which probably will be also um, uh, at the core of our priority during our uh, EU presidency, which will take place during the first semester of 2022. So I think it's a good preparation for that. Uh, but I'm not the expert, it's uh, Thomas Gomar is, so I'm, I, I will also hear with a lot of uh, interest and I wish you an interesting conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for introducing uh, Mr. Gomar, but also thank you very much for this opportunity to have uh, this event and to bring over such a prominent speaker. And indeed, uh, Mr. Gomar is not only the director of the French Institute of uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, he's also an expert, expert on the post-Soviet space of Russia, of uh, geo geopolitics and international relations. And he is also an ardent uh, writer and uh, he's uh, written a number of articles and books. And the two last, uh, the one is about the panic 
back in the world and 10 uh, issues, uh, geopolitical issues in the world. And the last one, which is still in the publishing house, but somehow I has managed to download it all from the internet. So uh, the one, the newest one is about the um, invisible words. In our region, when we talk about the invisible words, we very often think about the hybrid warfare. But uh, what I find in the book of Mr. Gama that uh, he talks a lot about uh, changing power balances in various fields, including you know, what are the uh, consequences of this COVID-19 pandemia. And on one hand, we can see that uh, there is a increasing fight uh, between the West and the East. But on the other hand, with the long, long four year administration of Donald Trump, there was a degradation of the US uh, power and the moral face to keep the current existing international order. And the Europe is somehow lost the where, what way to go. And there were a lot of discussions about European strategic uh, autonomy. First of all, these discussions were uh, related to the strength, uh, stronger EU role in the areas of defense and foreign policy. But today what I hear, it is more all encompassing concept, also taking into account the economic interest financial interest, um, chains of su supply in, in, within the Europe, uh, medical interest, some kind of a knowledge autonomy as well. So it's gonna be interesting to hear uh, what Mr. Tomán Gomar has researched and what are his views on these very important processes and what is are his recommendations for European Union, what steps it should uh, take, not to be late to jump onto the train towards the success and having a power, having a say in the uh, future international relations. So Mr. Goma, the floor is yours. Uh, we agreed that Mr. Goma will speak around 20 minutes and then the floor will be open for the questions from the audience. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, of course, I would like to thank warmly um, Margarita, uh, Madame l'Ambassadeur, Cher Claire, and also Thomas Buffin from the Institut Francais for their very kind invitation. I'm very happy uh, to, to make this uh, webinar with you, even if I, I would prefer, obviously, to be um, to be to be with you, but uh, I think uh, I hope it will be in a, in a near in the near future. Um, so indeed, you know, I I, I, wrote, I wrote this uh, book uh, about, uh, on uh, in, invisible wars, and I I've chosen this title to separate you know um, the book into two parts. The first one is about the visible things. And the second one is about the invisible things, you know, like an iceberg. You have the, the thing you see uh, out of the sea, and you have many things uh, down to the sea. And that's precisely, I think, the situation for the international system. What is interesting is to analyze what is very visible, but also to try to understand what we could call the covered drivers of the uh, international uh, system. So that's that's basically the um, the the idea. The second idea of this book, um, you write, uh, Margarita, uh, in uh, in Lithuania or in different parts of, of Europe. Very often, invisible war sounds with hybrid warfare. Uh, that's one aspect uh, of the topic. But my perspective is broader uh, because uh, I, I do believe that the uh, um, international politics is based on cooperation, which is uh, very important and uh, on which we, we should uh, work actively, but also on competition and confrontation, I would say, unfortunately. But uh, I, I, I think it's very important not to be only focused on cooperation or not to be 
only focused on confrontation. And precisely this title is an attempt to, to link cooperation, competition, and uh, confrontation. Um, the third idea with this title, it is also to say that, in my opinion, uh, Guerre Invisible, it's not uh, something coming, you know, it, it's not the, the near future. It is something in which we are already. I think that this invisible war started. When precisely, I don't know, but uh, we, 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 could, we could elaborate on that. But the main idea is to say for, for Europe, it's very important for the EU, it's very important to, to understand um, this uh, fast moving situation. And uh, the fact that, in, once again, in my opinion, we are already facing this uh, type of, uh, of warfare. And the fact that, for instance, the EU Commission uh, presents itself now as a geopolitical commission is a signal among others that we are, uh, that there is a, a sort of um, uh, common mindset about you know, a much more dangerous, a much more uh, risky, uh, environment for, 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 for the EU. So uh, I will try to, to, to deal with uh, six uh, brief points in my presentation before the, um, the, the, the Q&A. The, three, the first three points will be about the overall framework and um, the, the, the other last three points will be on the uh, transformation of the um, uh, the main point of transformation, in my opinion, of the um, international system right now. So let me start with the uh, with the uh, with the framework. Um, the first the first point is related to another book, uh, which was very important for me, which is uh, unrestricted warfare, and in fact, guerres invisible is a answer to uh, unrestricted warfare. Uh, which was written by two Chinese officers in 1999, which was translated into French in 2003. And uh, at that time, I read this book because I was uh, uh, teaching uh, like you, Margarita, for, for the students. So I, I, I read it and I was, I must confess, very impressed by, by, by this book, which explained, in fact, the, chi the two Chinese officers explain that uh, in the future, without any precise timeline, in their opinion, we will be faced to uh, uh, 24 types of warfare, coming from nuclear warfare to media warfare, to uh, sanitary warfare, to financial warfare, and so on. And uh, I remember when I read that, it's, it's, it, it seems to me at that time very, very strange, very, very strange. And uh, more or less, sorry, than 20 years after, I do believe we are in this context of uh, something with different types, something of combination and addition of different types of wars, which are not purely military, uh, but does that mean that the military uh, does not matter? But which is in fact a situation with uh, many overlappings between different fields of, um, of, uh, of action. Um, the other thing important to say that it is to say that, in my opinion, since uh, the publication of this, uh, of this book, um, something happened. It is the fact that China became number two on the international scene at the expense of the EU. And China does pretend to become number one, as you know, with this timeline, which is 2049, uh, the celebration of the uh, third anniversary of the um, uh, Chinese Popular Republic. But in fact, during the last two decades, we have this shift uh, the EU was number two on the international scene with this very um, narrow transatlantic uh, relationship with the US. And now uh, the EU uh, has become number, number three to, 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 to some extent. Um, the second point is about um, this idea of overlappings 
between different uh, different fields or different types of, of, uh, of activities. Uh, Guerre Invisible helps me to describe, you know, this overlapping between um, peace and war, between uh, external and internal affairs, and between what is a civilian and military activities. And um, I, I, I do think that this uh, type of overlapping can be observed in, um, in many European uh, countries. It leads to the idea of uh, interdependence uh, with the um, sanitary crisis we are, we are uh, suffering. Um, we understood what does it mean interdependence? I mean, it was, it was a notion quite um, uh, not, not very tangible, I, I would say, before this type of crisis. Now we do understand that any type of interdependence can be stopped. And in fact, every interdependence is asymmetrical. And the point is to be on the right part of the asymmetry. I mean, every type of interdependence can be blocked by an economic or a political decision, like a barrier you decide to, 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 to left or to, or, 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 or to, or to keep. Um, and in my opinion, and the book is about that, I do think that interdependence um, will, um, will continue because of the different type of constraints we will suffer, sanitary constraints, ecological con constraints, technological con constraints. Also, with this idea of uh, overlappings, you have um, a paradox, which is a, a reluctance in international affairs, depending especially among great powers, uh, to use a force directly and to use military force directly. That's another issue for uh, other actors. Think about the situation in, in, in Syria, for instance. But between great powers, there is this idea that the use of force should be restricted, should be limited. But um, uh, uh, um, in spite of that, you have also uh, an increase in the using of other tools like uh, economic statecraft, like uh, cyber operation, like uh, operation of uh, corruption, like uh, disinformation, and so on. So one, one thing about uh, I try to, 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 to deal with was precisely you know, the shift between direct use of force, direct use of massive force, and different types of, um, of conflicts. That doesn't mean, in my, in my opinion, that massive use of force should be um, rejected, or, I mean, intellectually, that doesn't mean that we should not prepare ourselves to this possibility, but, uh, but I observe that um, the, the other options, like the ones I have just mentioned, are more and more used by uh, great, uh, great powers. The third point is, is about you know, the, um, the main arguments uh, I have made in, in the book to try to, to delimit this um, this uh, framework of analysis. Um, the very first point is to see that uh, we are facing, in my view, two big trends converging. The first one is the environmental uh, degradation and its acceleration with global warming, with the uh, decrease of um, biodiversity, and with uh, the increase of pollution. To, to, to put things bluntly. And on the other side, you have a technological proliferation, uh, more and more uh, technological um, means. Uh, just to, 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 to give you a, a figure, in uh, 2025, you will have uh, in the world uh, 1,000 billion uh, digital terminals. No, including, by the way, one billion of uh, of um, uh, video camera, digital video camera. So, so that's just to to illustrate, to reflect, you know, 
uh, how deep uh, this, um, these two trends are. And we are in a sort of doxa, maybe less in Europe than in China or in the US, but you have this doxa in, in China and the US. That's the first um, trend, the uh, environmental uh, degradation will be solved by the second one. Uh, and personally, I am not sure at all. But for instance, in terms of uh, new programs of geoengineering, you have a lot of steps made by China, made by the US, uh, whether uh, for, for Europe, it is something which should be, you know, with ends of, in fact, geoengineering programs. But I do think that's, that is one of the biggest issue we will have to, to deal with in the next uh, in the next decade. So that leads me to the um, to the second argument I try to, to make in the book. Um, I do think that um, China and the US, uh, both country uh, represent, as you know, more than uh, 45, 45 percent of the global um, uh, emission of, um, of uh, CO2. Um, that's two, that's the two uh, biggest uh, economy, very extractive economies, completely interpenetrated. So that means that, and facing, you know, the, the next COP or so just after the, the new uh, summit, uh, we, we add on, on climate um, organized by, the, by President Biden that to some extent global warming is um, first of all, I would say a question between China um, and, the, and the US. That means that in my opinion, both country, China and the US subordinates their respective climate policy and digital policy to their uh, strategic revolving. And that's uh, the biggest difference of understanding between China, the US, uh, and Europe. The second, um, the third, sorry, uh, argument uh, I have made in the book, it is to say that this strategic value between uh, China and, uh, and the US is completely different from the uh, strategic value we had during the Cold War between the, the um, USSR and the, and the US. We will be back on that certainly. And um, this rivalry creates sort of um, strategic vacuum or strategic um, uh, area of uh, recomposition, especially in a European neighborhood. Uh, no need uh, uh, at this stage to elaborate on Russia, but uh, maybe I need to just to point out, you know, the transformation of the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean um, area, for instance, with the action of, of, of Russia, with the action of Iran, and with the action of Turkey, for instance. Just, just, um, just an example. But that means that Europeans will, uh, uh, will deal with you know, their um, strategic uh, environment more quickly than expected. And uh, the question is for them two things, are they able to do so by themselves? And second, to what extent they will be attracted uh, into the trap of the uh, tension between China uh, and the US? Is it possible for uh, Europeans to keep hands off about what is going, what is happening, you know, in the China Sea, for instance? So that's also, um, something I, um, I explore uh, in the book. Let me continue with the second part and the three uh, other points I would like to, to make about the transformation of the, um, of, um, uh, the, global, uh, the, 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 the global situation. The very first point is to try to, to describe, you know, the transformation we are uh, observing from a geopolitic based on uh, oil and gas, to put things very bluntly, towards the geopolitics we, will be, we, which sorry, will be more and more focused on data. 
we are, in my, in my view, coming from a geopolitics of oils, very well known. You know, okay, producer countries, con uh, consumer countries, um, what sort of, of channels between them, where financing, that's more or less something which is all the time, you know, very carefully analyzed, for instance, by universities and think tanks or, or consulting firms. Quite well known, you know, the relation with Middle East countries, the relation with Russia and so on. And uh, we are going towards a, a, a geopolitics of data, which is much more difficult to analyze for uh, reasons I, um, I, explain, I, I explain the book. To reflect on these two, fig two figures, you know, in June 2020, if you compare the market capitalization of the seven main digital companies in the world with the uh, seven main uh, energy major uh, uh, capi uh, market capitalization, you have uh, a big delta. The seven first ones represent uh, uh, 7,200 billion of dollars, whereas the seven energy major represented uh, 2,500 billion dollars. Um, if you observe carefully these 14 companies, you have only one European one, which is Shell. So it's, it's important to have you know, this figure in mind to understand this uh, very quick uh, transformation. As I said, you know, the oil, uh, the geopolitics of oil, and when, I, when I'm saying geopolitics of oil, that's also gas and so on, is quite well known. Just a, a quick reminder, the first main uh, producing countries are the US, uh, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. And the three main consumers are uh, China, India, and the EU. Just, uh, just with this list, you have already um, a level of complexity uh, and also uh, um, uh, something, something important to have in mind to understand the uh, organization of uh, the uh, uh, maritime routes and also uh, their uh, need for naval protection, for instance. Uh, for data, it's much more complicated. Because I do think, especially in Europe, we quite well understand what I call in the book the um, digital military complex. I mean, this interfax between armed forces and systemic platforms, to put things bluntly, between US uh, armed forces or US uh, intelligence community and the GAFAM on the one side. And on the other side, the same in China. It is more or less uh, understood on the US side because it's an open system, because it's a system based on the separation of powers. It's much more unclear, to say the, uh, the least, uh, on the Chinese side. And the problem for Europeans, it's precisely uh, to be between these two, two players because as Europeans, we don't have similar tools in terms of uh, competing for uh, geopolitics of data. And we, 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 could, we could elaborate uh, on that uh, later on. Point number five, um, the uh, in artificial intelligence and uh, all its geopolitical consequences. I have uh, two chapters on that in the book. Maybe three, four, sorry, uh, brief points to, to have in mind to try to address this, this issue quickly. The very first one is about talents. Um, I found a very interesting paper from Graham Allison about you know, the talents for uh, artificial intelligence. And um, according to me, the issue for, for the US is the ability to attract what he calls uh, the briest of the briest. That means um, uh, 700,000 people uh, who are the ones who make uh, Silicon Valley working. And how do you attract these talents? And obviously, that's the same question for 
the Chinese. So it's a very limited number uh, uh, of people having, you know, a, a, a very important leverage power to some extent. What is very important for Europeans, it is the fact that to some extent Silicon Valley is working thanks to a lot of uh, European engineers. And the same can be said also in China. So how do we organize, or do we want only to organize um, what we are um, educating you know, on the European soil? And that's, I think, a very tricky question for all, uh, all Europeans. Second, um, the robotization, which is um, accelerating, especially in Japan, in Korea, in China, in the US. Uh, in, in, in Europe, Germany is, um, is running well. Other European countries are um, not doing well. So also robotization is increasing the um, industrial um, efficiency among Europeans um, and the fact that Germany has a lead, which is of course good, good, good news, but with also consequences for uh, other European uh, uh, countries. Third point, remote intelligence, which is uh, changing the way of working and which is a sort of um, new type of migration to some extent. Let me explain. Uh, more and more European economy are um, focused on services, and more and more, thanks to artificial intelligence, these services will be uh, organized or will be proposed uh, from outsiders. And um, we can also we are you. I have some figure on that. You know the. The, the type of services we could we could uh, propose in the in the future is very related to our ability to uh, manage in, uh, artificial intelligence properly. And last uh, point, you know, the uh, conductors, the microchips, which is um, very important at the time being, you know, between uh, between China, the US, and and Europe, because it is at the core. Uh, of the, the development. I, I could be back on that uh, if you want. Point number six, uh, what type of relation we, we, should, um, we should think about between civilian activities and military activities? It's very important in terms of innovation because historically innovation came from the military to go to civilian application. And now we are certainly uh, facing a reverse approach. Many things are coming, for, coming from civilian activities and are adapted by mi the military when the military is able to do so. There are not many, many um, military forces able to do so, by the way. Uh, but that leads to, to something very important, which is the um, capability in terms of investment. What is fascinating with the systemic platform, I mean, the GAFAM, it is the fact that they deliver very low um, dividends to their owner, but they do invest massively their, uh, their gains, you know, and so massively that their ability to invest is now completely disproportionate with the ability of states to invest for innovation and research, and especially for the ability of um, European states to do so. So one big question is now the type of um, arrangement, the type of organization between you know, investment coming from systemic platforms and broader actors, I mean, in the uh, industrial field or in the services field, and uh, the investment um, made by uh, by some uh, some states. On that, there is something very, very, very important for Europeans, which is um, the space industry. Um, Madame l'ambassadeur referred uh, in her introduction to the uh, French presidency, and um, this topic should be. Uh, 
at the core of the uh, uh, EU French presidency in 2022 for one obvious reasons is the fact that the market of special services will expand um, significantly in the next decade. Second, we are facing a weaponization of space activities with more and more, uh, I would say, power attitude, the US obviously, but China, Russia, India, Israel, Iran, I can, con I can continue. And the fact that more and more, our access to internet will be also related to the, the, the constellation of uh, nano satellites. So that's for Europeans, a key issue, and especially a key issue to maintain the ability to access by ourselves to the space, which is, um, uh, in my view, something uh, we should defend, in fact, even if there are some uh, attempts to explain to Europeans that uh, access to, to space could be done in the future through uh, private um, private actors. When you observe, when you analyze how uh, these private actors uh, do work, and uh, I, I do so in the, in, the, in the book, you understand that the support of state, especially the US one, is highly important. So uh, that leads me to the conclusion of this um, brief, uh, brief presentation. Um, I do think, and Guerres Invisibles is a, an attempt in the French debate, you know, to, to, to fuel the, the French debate on that, that yes, there is a need to invest more uh, in defense, in cyber in intelligence, as it was uh, said by Margarita in her uh, introduction. And I think that uh, this debate should not be only uh, a French one. Uh, it is something also visible, you know, uh, in the UK when you read the integrated review, which has, has, has just been published, for, for, for instance. But it's a challenge for many European countries, which continue to under, in my view, invest on their uh, defense and security um, uh, matters for, for, for different reasons. But um, I think it will be uh, less and less um, feasible to some extent, given this evolution of the, of the strategic environment. And the final point I would like to make is to think about you know, the, um, the big cycles in which uh, we are. So in the book, I, in the conclusion, I, I try to, to describe you know, the the big cycles, the strategic cycles, the political cycle, economics, economic cycle, sociological cycle, technological, environmental, globally speaking, and uh, um, the, the cycle for France. Um, to conclude, I, I would like to uh, I would like to focus on three cycles uh, at the global level: the strategic one, the political one, and the economic one. For me, you know, the strategic cycle in which we are started, started sorry, in 1950 with the war in Korea. That's the cycle, that's the strategic cycle in which we are, in my opinion. That means that the center of gravity is clearly, you know, um, uh, in East Asia. And uh, why it is so important is the fact that Chinese authorities never forgot, you know, the um, temptation by Makachu to use nuclear weapons. And I do think that we are still, or we are in this uh, strategic cycle. That means that Europe, from this point of view, will be uh, less important. That's that's the first the, the first thing. So the political cycle in which we are, in my view, started in 1989. Uh, of course, with the, the fall of Berlin Wall and the democratization of, um, of Europe. But before the uh, Berlin Wall, uh, we had Tiananmen. So the question is, in fact, uh, is it right now the spirit of Beijing 
which is um, winning, or is it the spirit of Berlin? And uh, frankly speaking, I don't know how to respond. You know, uh, and maybe that's that's um, that's uh, an issue for for our debates. And the last uh, cycle is, is the economic one. It started, in my opinion, in uh, 1979, uh, 1980, with two things: the so-called um, uh, ultra-liberalism, you know, promoted by uh, President Reagan and introduced uh, in Europe by uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, the regulation, uh, uh, financial activities, decrease of the state interventionism, and so on. But this policy, this wave, is, in my opinion, completely and narrowly related to the openness of the Chinese markets. You, can't, you cannot understand it without taking into consideration the openness of the Chinese markets. And I think we are facing the end of this cycle, which leads to the question about what, who, or which country or which area will be the next China, you know, for, for the continuation of the capitalism as we organized it during the, the last four, four, four decades. And it remains uh, an open question on which um, I finish this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomar, indeed, for a very thought provoking intervention, touching upon the major processes and powers uh, what, that we are facing today in the international affairs, but probably we are not able still to see some of the processes. We feel that things are changing and then they're changing exponentially, but we still miss some of the connections and it's difficult to say what kind of world we will see in let's say five or 10 years. So you were uh, talking about the trends, various trends that we see in various areas, but you, little, uh, you talked a, uh, a little or you didn't talk much about the ideological or value perspective of these shifts and these changes, because the one, the power who gains most of the power, who gains control uh, of the world, it will be probably able to promote its values for also other, other players. And what we are fearing today that, you know, if China is becoming number one, what kind of the world we will be facing. And one of the most debated scenarios in uh, the debates uh, about the future international relations is about the split of the world into two uh, worlds, like during the Cold War, based on the ideology, the free, freedom-loving world, uh, the West and the friends, an authoritarian world, uh, controlled world, uh, probably based on the rule of China. And what I've seen from what the, the trends that you were mentioning, the trends enable, in my opinion, the formation of this world, because what we see now that, you know, the Free world, we are talking a lot about the deregulation deregu of the digital environment, regulation of the artificial intelligence to preserve the freedoms, the values of the individual. Whereas what we see in China and other authoritarian countries that they, on one hand, use these technologies to promote more surveillance vis-a-vis -vis their uh, society, but also they use this, uh, uh, use the COVID-19 pandemia also to reinforce these controls. So what is your opinion about the potential uh, scenario of two worlds, free and uh, authoritarian world, and where is the place of Europe in this world? Is it in between or it's a part of this united uh, free world? Thank you. Well, I have um, many many questions in your in your comments. Um, first one, first first point. You know, 
One of the big difference between China and the US, it is precisely the fact that China has no uh, military allies, whereas uh, the US uh, has a system of military allies. And it's uh, clear that, you know, the attempts, not only uh, from the, uh, it's something started, you know, with the, uh, the Bush administration, the Bush junior administration to some extent, um, with a, a deep continuation between Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden administration, it is to make a NATO pivot toward China. That seems to me very clear, you know. And if you read, for instance, uh, uh, the last document, you know, produced by the um, the group of experts, you know, um, it's it's very um, visible. Um, second, you have also uh, different approaches between European countries. For instance, in, in France, uh, we reject the idea of equidistance between Beijing uh, and Washington because of this alliance system. And we observed that there are many uh, European um, countries which decided to have also, you know, the China plus 17 group. Uh, that means some European countries which do want to participate more or less to the uh, uh, BRI project. So we are divided in fact, and for a country like Germany, um, what is very well observed, it is this capability to be very narrow to Washington in pure security terms through NATO and also very narrow to Beijing for uh, its trade policies. Um, so it's, it's very complicated for, for Europe, uh, which in fact uh, fear to be trapped by the rivalry between China um, uh, and the US. Third point, one response proposed by some um, European uh, members namely before Brexit, uh, the UK, France, uh, Germany, now also uh, Spain, to some extent also the Netherlands, it is to have, you know, a sort of Indo-Pacific approach to say uh, there is a world east of Suez. And it's not against China, but it's also to, to say, given that we anticipate the the fact that the center of gravity of the world system will be in Eastern Asia. Europe uh, would like to continue to benefit from this growth, to be active and so on. So should develop a no uh, Pacific strategy. That's, that's also related to the good relation we, 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 we would like to have with India, with Japan, with Australia, uh, with also ASEAN countries and uh, our commitment to the freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation, you know, that's, that's in my view, the real European issue. Why? Because um, globalization before everything is based on maritimization. And that's also, you have also a link which is interesting to, to, be, to be explored, you know, between maritimization and democratization. But um, uh, on that, you know, uh, that's, that's very challenging because there are many European countries in which when you are speaking about that, you know, it's seen as something very far away. Uh, no, that's not our business, you know, we, indeed it is in, in, in my view. The first point is, is about the values, which is a, a very, important uh, uh, question. Um, we are, you know, in a situation in, in, in which the so-called Western values are more and more rejected in the world. There, uh, the universalism they are promoted, promoting, sorry, is, uh, is question. I can elaborate, you know, within the United Nations system in which Europeans countries are more and more on a defensive position uh, on, you know, for instance, uh, gender balance, things like that. I, 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 could, I, could elaborate, I could elaborate. 
on the other side, you have this notion of ASEAN values, um, which are seen as more efficient, where the collective is seen uh, more important than the individual, to, to put things very uh, 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 bluntly. And on that, there is a very interesting, in my view, that's something on which I elaborate in the book, there is a, a very important source of inspiration uh, who is, uh, was, sorry, Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore. Why it is so important? Because you, you, that's fascinating to, to observe the leaders who referred or we, who are referring to Lee Kuan Yew right now, you know, from Kagame to Viktor Orban or to um, the Chinese leaders. And you have, you have this idea that um, uh, ba basically you need a, a strong state interventionism. At the same time, you, you need to invest massively on your uh, educational system. And what was done you know, by Singapore is absolutely remarkable, uh, but it was clearly also done um, and it's, it's a success uh, which didn't follow at all the so-called Western values. And for China, it's it's um, it's a uh, it's a model in the sense that you can have economic development without uh, political uh, openness. Uh, that's a big challenge for Europeans, you know, to contradict that, because we 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 are still in this path, which in my view should should should, should be should be continued, obviously. That's, you know, economic development um, is based on political diversity, political openness, and so on. But that's not what is uh, thought, you know, especially in, um, in Asia. And we, and we are now, in my view, in terms of values, in a much more challenge, challenging situation in Europe because all values uh, are seen as um, less, uh, efficient than that there were, you know, uh, just after Berlin Fall. That's why, you know, I made this uh, reminder between uh, Berlin Fall, but just before that, three months before, there was Tiananmen. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite our students to pose the questions. And I also wanted to remind for those who are watching us, uh, uh, live on uh, Facebook and also probably LRT that uh, it's possible to write the questions and I'll receive them. So you know how to raise the hand and I hope that they, I will see that. Um, do, do I see any hands or so everyone? Uh -huh, see two hands, wonderful. Indre. Hello, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture and, uh, and points. Uh, I would like to, uh, since you're an expert on uh, Russia and, and French foreign policy, I wanted to uh, ask you about President Macron and his position uh, of France in general towards Russia. As you know, he visited Lithuania last September and he had a very strong this inviting message about a new dialogue uh, with Russia and a new architecture of security uh, with Russia. And he said that um, if we want to establish uh, lasting peace, we have to work with Russia uh, since we share common history and geography and, and, and the past and that uh, Russia essentially is European and we cannot ex escape that basically. Uh, but now that the situation in, in Ukraine, uh, near Ukraine's border with Russia is escalating uh, very quickly and uh, we can say to paraphrase that the, the wars are getting more visible and um, and uh, and he said actually a couple of days ago I think that uh, that we should draw clear red lines and ensure that we look credible to, 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 to Russia and uh, together with uh, the Western allies. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, how do you uh, perceive this, uh, this situation and, and the position? And do you think that, um, uh, that the president's uh, perspective changed at all since, uh, since uh, I don't know, last year and so on? And, uh, and uh, 
in general, do you think that there is a possibility to to engage with dialogue uh, with Russia, considering uh, it's uh, quite aggressive weaponization of information and, and, and the whole situation in, in Ukraine and, and, and Belarus and so on? And uh, how do you integrate it in your uh, framework of cooperation, competition, confrontation? Do you think that it's possible to, to cooperate at, at all? And what means should we uh, use in, in this uh, building confrontation? then thank you thank you thank you Indra maybe I'll take another question if it's possible then we'll uh, save the time probably Victoria and Adam uh, first of all Victoria and Adam I, I, I see that you have uh, put down the hand but now you are raising again Victoria hello good afternoon director thank you for this interesting presentation and uh, taking this opportunity I would also like to to raise a question um, related to competition between uh, uh, the European Union, uh, China and the United States. So my question is related to the comprehensive agreement on investment that has been signed by the European Union and China just before the new year. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it was um, characterized as being um, um, not, uh, uh, not agreed or not um, um, coordinated with the US uh, and there was a certain criticism from the from the part of the US that the EU is acting hastily and um, also um, even provoking uh, the US's anger without without coordinating this position with with uh, President Biden but also on the other hand it was said that uh, the US uh, has a respective agreement the phase one agreement with China as well and this is just uh, uh, bringing the European Union on a par with, with the EU, United States, which already has such an agreement. So what should, what should be the position of the European Union? Is it acting um, uh, thereby as um, establishing its strategic autonomy as it, as, it, uh, as it is claiming so? Or is it uh, making it um, uh, even more, uh, is it making its relations with, with the United States even more tense while not uh, gaining anything substantial from the part of China, because it, it was said that this agreement will not bring substantial benefits to the EU. So what would be your position on, on this? Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And the last question goes to Adam. Adam, please. Uh, thank you very much for, for a very interesting presentation. I would like to also to ask about Russia and uh, maybe thinking about the longer terms about Russia. Uh, I'm interested, uh, what, what are the main driving uh, forces behind Macron uh, wish to, to develop dialogue with Russia, taking in mind that Russia is quite often behaving in bad faith with EU, has taken the many, many aggressive steps towards the Union. Uh, so I would just like to quickly um, ask you about the, the driving and the rationale of it uh, and exactly from the French perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So, Mr. Gomart, uh, so it's not surprising you came, although virtually to Lithuania, so there are two questions on Russia and one on China. That's, uh, that's um, innovation. So, Mr. Gomart, please. Let... Okay, so, so I, I start with the question coming from Victoria and I will uh, gather the, the two questions from uh, Adam and uh, from uh, Indre on, um, on Russia. Well, um, first thing, in 2010, um, the EU plus uh, the US plus uh, China represented 56% uh, of the uh, global wealth. Uh, five, six percent. Uh, depending on the trends, you know, I'm using the, the trends by the Commission. In 2030, they are supposed to represent 54 um, percent of of uh, global in 2030. It is a fact that uh, China was around 11 percent in 2010 and will be around uh, 28%. percent so, so China did that, the US did that, and Europe did that. Um, so, so just 
it's it's a reminder that you know in my opinion we should maybe anticipate the coming back of china towards what was its level in the uh, uh, global economy during the modern period which was around 30 percent you know of the global wealth and we are approaching this point so you will have a centrality of china in uh, economic terms you know by the way uh, in the um, when we had you know the, the big discoveries starting uh, from the portuguese in the in the in the 15th century so portuguese you know went to asia it was not to conquer, to conquer you know as it was very often uh, explained it was much more to plug themselves on the asian especially especially the chinese economy but the, the main activities were there it's important you know because uh, uh five five centuries after it is china uh which is purchasing you know uh, portuguese arbors and it is uh, chinese assets that we will have on the atlantic uh later on so, so just to 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 try also to to think um about that you know in um in the historical perspective um now with the uh, with the ag uh, agreement first as you know it was negotiated since many years 13 years it was uh, concluded at the end of the german presidency uh, and uh, as you as you rightly said there was a lot of um, critics critics you know from the us because it was done just before the, the beginning of the biden uh, uh, administration now there is a step of the european parliament and um, the uh, attitude of china uh, created a lot of critics, you know, for instance, the sanctions, very limited sanctions uh, decided by the EU regarding the situation in Xinjiang uh, provoked some uh, strong uh, uh, sanctions coming from China. So I think that politically, the uh, situation between the EU and China uh, if you compare what was decided in December and the situation in April for four months after, has changed. Um, so that's that's my um, my reading. That leads to something much more tricky for all European country. It is the um, tension I observe between the strategic community, which is more and more concerned by the Chinese attitude, by the evolution of the Chinese diplomacy. No need to, to elaborate on that. Um, and the attempts or uh, the attitude of the business community. Because, you know, for business, especially for big companies, you are very primitive uh, way of thinking, but uh, primitive and consequently efficient. It is to say, have a look about the size of the Chinese market. We could not avoid it. So you have this tension, which is very, very visible, especially in Germany, especially in France, especially in the UK, also certainly in uh, in other uh, 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 European countries. And that's that's really the that's really the the problem because some European companies, you know, um, are in a situation where they do think they do try to make fair competition. But it's not fair competition, either with the US companies or with the Chinese companies. Why? Because with the Chinese companies, you have the SOEs, you have also the uh, obligation to make some uh, uh, intellectual property transfer. And um, is it to, to what extent it can be accepted? But you have very, very tricky, you know, transfer, which was made by some uh, European comp companies, for instance, for the nuclear plants. Just one example of the telecommunication industry. So now it's it's also a question for European companies: Do they want to okay to address the Chinese market at the expense, you know, uh, or by uh, accepting to make some uh, some technological uh, transfer? The other problem it is that um, this 
uh, understanding of China is it can be also outdated, given the fact that in some sectors, Chinese companies are now in advance technologically. That's all the debate about 5G, for instance. So it is, if we want to stay in the competition, or do we take, or do we manage our technological transfer as Europeans? And that leads to the question on the relation between technological transfer and military alliances. No time to, to continue on that with the 5G debate, which, which was a very interesting uh, debate because uh, if you observe the, the difference of position between Germany, the UK and France, for instance, that's fascinating because as you certainly know, 5G uh, equipment is based on 4G equipment. And uh, uh, for Germany, for, for the UK, and it was not in the same proportion for France for different reasons but it was namely Chinese equipments because they were good, they were cheaper than uh, European uh, equipments. So it's di very difficult, you know, when you are in this, uh, in this type of path to, to, to divert, but it was made by the UK. You know, the decision taken, you know, by the UK in last um, uh, June, July, sorry, very pressured by the Trump administration and also given the evolution in Hong Kong. So you, you had a reverse attitude of the UK, but initially the UK was very, very uh, fond to, to, to deploy, you know, a Chinese 5G. Uh, so I, I think that it should be a mix, for instance, for the 5G. I think that the decision taken by France is very careful, very balanced, um, quite efficient. Uh, in my knowledge, and I, I, I think it's it's this sort of, of question that every European country um, will have to, to to deal with in the in the coming uh, coming de decades. Um, question now about the big question about Russia uh, and about you know the uh, the French foreign policy uh, towards Russia. Well, first observation, you know, as an historian. Um, I made this uh, this point, you know, after the the Bregançon summit in August 2019, when uh, President Macron uh, received uh, President Putin. Um, if you observe, you know, all, all the presidency of the French presidency uh, since the beginning of our fifth uh, constitution. I mean, since uh, 1958 you have very similar path. In terms of foreign policy, it started all the time towards Washington. Afterward, we go towards Germany. And afterwards, there is a step which is more symbolical than, uh, uh, than everything else towards uh, the USSR slash Russia. But the point is that, you know, at the core of the French foreign policy, you have two main drivers. You have the P3 since 1917, this very narrow relation with London and Washington, and you have the uh, relation with Germany on the other side. That's the two main drivers, and for the relation with Germany, obviously it is uh, at the core of the European project since um, 1957. So I, I won't, you know, overestimate the impact towards uh, what was decided by President Macron towards uh, uh, Russia. Uh, having said that, you have also the situation in Russia uh, where, uh, in fact, uh, the try to improve the relation between France uh, and, and Russia was also very limited because, as you said, we had also some disinformation, also very tough uh, attitude of uh, Russia against France. For instance, the interference during the presidential election in 1917, um, uh, for, for, for instance. That's why also uh, France decided to participate, you know, in the uh, very precise assessments, you know, in France about also 
the type of strategic intimidation made by, by Russia, the, the type of hybrid things, things made under the level of warfare. I cannot elaborate on that today, but um, it is things very well observed, you know, also in, in France. So I, I would say there is no naivete, you know, about uh, the trend uh, taken by uh, Putin's Russia. But you have this idea that uh, Russia will continue after Putin's presidency. And that we will have to uh, deal with uh, uh, Russia as we will have to deal with Turkey, as we will have to deal with uh, um, our neighbored countries. Um, the second point is also about uh, 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 what was uh, expressed by Indre about, you know, the uh, projects of new uh, architecture of security. I think it is needed. And I think that on that, President Macron is uh, right. How it's possible, you know, for Europeans after the end of the INF Treaty by Russia and by the US just to say, oh, it's not our business. We don't care about these sort of things. How is it just possible, you know, to, to think that uh, without INF Treaty, it's the good news for European countries, if, especially for Germany, by the way. Um, so on that, I do think that President Macron was absolutely right. There is no possible to try to stabilize things in pure security terms uh, without Russia, without Ukraine, without uh, uh, Baltic, sta Baltic states, we, we, without uh, Co uh, Caucasian countries and so on. But uh, if, there was, if there is no framework to discuss that, it will be only between uh, the US um, uh, and, and Russia in a, in, a, in a situation in which uh, their relations were very, very bad. Remind, you know, the Helsinki uh, summits between Trump and Putin. So, you know, on that, on the uh, new architecture of security, I do think there is, there is a clear need to address Russia without naivete. But the fact is, um, uh, it, is uh, it is a component of any type of uh, European um, uh, security. Last point, which is important, I think, for, for Lithuania, for many European countries. Um, Certainly, there is a difference of uh, uh, assessment, you know, uh, in France regarding the attitude of Russia. First, first of all, obviously, what, for instance, the use of chemical weapons is a, a red line. I'm very careful about this notion of red line for <laughs> historical, you know, um, reasons, but for sure, uh, it is it is it is a very serious concern, you know, uh, in Paris. What happened with Skripal uh, in in the UK? What happened, you know, with with Navalny because this use of chemical weapons, which is a clear transgression of one additional clear transgression by Russia uh, uh, of its uh, international commitments. Um, having said that, the assessment, you know. In France, uh, I, post, I participate, you know, in the last uh, strategic review in 2017, and um, we had very, very deep discussion on, on on Russia. The assessment is to say yes, there is uh, there is there is direct threat coming from Russia towards our allies, for instance, Baltic states, Poland, um, NATO, or NATO allies, or EU allies, but. Ukraine is in a different situation. Ukraine uh, does not belong to NATO and does not belong to the EU. So that's that's a difference. And uh, also you, you have certainly an assessment which is uh, slightly different from the one just published by the UK in its uh, integrated review. For the UK now, Russia is the main threat, uh, especially in Arctic in North uh, um, uh, Atlantic, uh, and also given, you know, the uh, uh, um, action of uh, uh, Russian services uh, on the uh, UK soil. 
Um, the assessment is slightly different because uh, for France, uh, there is uh, this idea that uh, we should try once again to uh, set up a new uh, architecture of security after the end of the INF Treaty without uh, any type of uh, naivete. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gamal. I still see one hand uh, being raised. So do we have time for one more question at least? Okay, so Luca, Luca, huh? are you with us? Yes, thank you. Bonjour, Monsieur Gomar. Uh, je vous remercie beaucoup pour votre uh, présentation. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, perhaps on a more positive note, if there are still some possibilities, since, as you said, um, China is still militarily, if not isolated, it doesn't have such a military uh, alliance as the US and our NATO uh, partnership and alliance. Perhaps as the EU, we could still try to attract and gather um, Asian countries, especially South Pacific Asia and uh, African countries as well, who are increasingly realizing that uh, Chinese influence and investments come with very strict obligations and, and a lot of um, you know expectations in return. So what would be the more positive windows of opportunity and uh, strategic steps that could be taken perhaps to rally those allies that are hopefully still in between the Western alliance and under the Chinese influence. Thank you, thank you, Luca. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luca, for, for, your, for your question. But you, are, you have this idea, you know, of um, defend and promote uh, multilateralism. You know, uh, what was um said you know by 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 france and other european countries uh, in the recent years was to to observe that multilateralism um was directly attacked by russia annexation of crimea destabilization of donbass what i have said about chemical uh, weapons for instance attitude in syria and so on veto uh, within the United Nations Security Council regarding uh, Syria. Um, multilateralism was attacked by China, freedom of navigation and so on, sanctions against some um, uh, South Asian uh, countries, um, and was also attacked by the US uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, attitude, you know, towards WTO, uh, Paris Agreement, Iran, and so on. So, with this uh, consideration, you 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 have decided, you know, for sort of uh, alliance of um, multilateralism to try to gather precisely um, the countries, not only in Europe, but uh, uh, you, you mentioned African and Asian countries. Yes, India was part of that, Australia, Canada, um, and, and, and so on. We've decided that um, we should defend and promote multilateralism because that's the only way to address uh, public good challenges, such as the climate change, so, such as you know, biodiversity, and so on. So, um, and, and, and frankly speaking, I, I do believe that many, many countries are, are eager you know, to defend and to promote that. Perfectly understand that given the global challenges we are all facing, um, we have no time you know, for a sort of, uh, even if there are some invisible wars, there is no time for a sort of a global confrontation. Um, now, the question is also, um, to what extent is it possible to, to, to make some progress, some uh, real and tangible progress um, until China and, uh, and the US are not on board? So that's why I, I do think that a lot depends on our, our own attitude and behavior to defend and to promote that, but also a lot of things are not at all in our hands are in Chinese and uh, American hands. 
So that's why also we, we should uh, try to, to convince them, you know, to, to that there are some uh, uh, global and common challenges that the, um, that all countries should tackle together. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. So I don't see more hands, but perhaps I still have one more question, which is, um, again, um, uh, sort of a very sensitive question, but I think it just uh, also demonstrates that the world is changing and the questions about the value systems are becoming quite re relevant. And this question is about Turkey as a member of NATO alliance. We've seen a lot of rifts uh, between Turkey and France, Turkey and the United States. And just over the weekend, uh, US President Joe Biden uh, has uh, named uh, what happened in Armenia, uh, named the genocide, which Turkey has uh, for a number of years considered being an insult. And on one hand, there is this trend that Turkey is becoming more radical in a way. On the other hand, there is probably more understanding and reaction in the Western domain. So what do you think, what will be the further steps, both in terms of Turkey, but also in the Western world, in the US, but also in the European Union? because this is also very important. Let's remember this insult for Madame von der Leyen uh, in, when she was visiting Erdogan. It, again, shows entirely different value systems. So, Mr. Gamar, what is your opinion and what is your take on that? Big question, but Margarita, if I may, it seems to me that uh, Claire um, uh, wanted also to, 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 inter to intervene because I, I, I have seen her end. Um, well, on Turkey, big issue. Um, first of all, on the I would say Turkish historical perspective. Uh, Turkey will celebrate, you know, in a nineteen uh, in a, sorry in two thousand twenty three, the anniversary of the uh, of the republic. Um, what is important with uh, President Erdogan, it is also is referring to. Uh, to, um, to Atatürk, but for some topics and not for other ones. What he decided, for instance, for Saint Sophie is very telling also uh, on uh, uh, his use of uh, religion as, um, as a tool. Um, regarding the, the relation, um, why I refer to that? Because I think that, to put things very bluntly, Turkey never accepted the consequences uh, of the end of what we call the First World War. And the fact that, you know, uh, Turkey cannot see, you know, the Asian Sea um, uh, like its is something um, on which, in fact, uh, they try to, to, to change, transform the situation against Greece. So it's, it's very deeply rooted, you know, in, uh, in the, uh, uh, quite um, in the in the in the sorry uh, the, the, the historical uh, background uh, regarding France and Turkey, two three things. First, uh, I think maybe uh, Claire will will correct me, but you have a problem of also the Turkish influence within France. Uh, through, uh, through, through the Turkish community. It can explain also the type of uh, uh, strong reaction by President Macron. Second, uh, you cannot accept that uh, a NATO ally targets one of your chip as it was done. And third, um, there was also a, a, 
a turning point when um, Paris, under, Paris and other European capitals understood that the Turkish military uh, was able to deploy very easily uh, 80,000 of troops in uh, northern Syria, for instance. There is no single European uh, army able to do so right now and uh, without nuclear weapons and so on. So it's, it's a step, you know, in, term, in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of perception. Related to that, you have mentioned also the Armenian genocide. That's very important for, 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 for France, given also the importance of the Armenian uh, community we, we, we have. And uh, this uh, uh, more um, radical, uh, Political, re religious influence you have um, you have mentioned. Having said that, Turkey is a balancing between NATO, uh, made some steps towards Russia, you know, uh, bought uh, S uh, 400, for hundred, for for instance. Um, you have this feeling that um, Russia and Turkey uh, fight each other in Syria, in Libya. But are also able to to make some some deals, for instance, uh, in the energy field in terms of uh, uh, weaponry procurements. Um, for me, one of the biggest question, you know, it is also a question for all Europeans. It is the invasion we we are facing with uh, with Turkey and uh, and uh, and Russia. You know, when I started in AT3 um, now 15 years ago. We had all this discussion about, about the Black Sea area. You know, the idea of uh, uh, access strategy towards the so-called Great Middle East. This idea that, okay, uh, Romania, Bulgaria joined uh, NATO 2004. So now NATO is very active in the Black Sea and through the Black Sea has the ability to reach uh, the Great Middle East. And Turkey was part of that, obviously after the intervention of, uh, of the US and the Brits, you know, in Iraq. Um, now the situation is reversed. Russia is dominating the Black Sea and uh, has the ability to reach the Middle, the Middle East, change the situation, the rapport de force uh, in Syria, for instance. And now there is something very, um, important and challenging for all Europeans, um, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, Europeans are less and less comfortable in that sea, you know, because you have the Russians, we are able to make some exercise very impressive. You have Turkey, you have sometimes also Iran, you will have also China. And to some extent, we are facing a situation in which more and more uh, Europeans are pushed from Mediterranean. You have the problem of uh, Central Mediterranean Sea with Libya and the migration uh, lines. And after that, you have Western Mediterranean Sea. But um, the point is that uh, Russia, uh, because of its um, uh, uh, transformation and because what was done in Georgia, annexation of Crimea and so on, is now the dominating power in Black Sea. And the question is, um, is it acceptable in the long run uh, for Turkey? And uh, I'm not sure. And that's why also we should we should follow very carefully the type of cooperation between Turkey and Ukraine for drone system, for instance. Also, uh, the uh, consideration coming from Turkey for Crimea. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gomar. Um, Madam Ambassador. Do you want to react? We have like one, one minute, two minutes, because we started late. Uh, thank you. Actually, I, I didn't want to react. I had another question to, to Thomas Gomar's uh, last question, but uh, I think he, he gave very good answers to the question that were raised. Uh, in the case of Turkey, of course, there was also um, what happens in some statements after the death of this uh, French teacher, you know, uh, who was beheaded. So, but anyhow, uh, I think that we had a very, very um, uh, comprehensive description of the different kind of confrontations today in the world today and, 
and this is interesting because in Europe, usually you, you have a more rosy picture about the future and what you said about the values that uh, our values are not necessarily interesting for uh, other countries, but still, what are the biggest assets for Europeans? Because I think we would like, if I can have uh, your views, Thomas, about that. Uh, is it uh, its talents? Because you said they are going to the United States. So is it something we can build on, uh, on upon? And uh, is it its capacity to reach, to have agreements with all uh, continents? Because even if it's difficult to, to negotiate with China, we have an agreement on investment and we try to get be a better deal uh, uh, with this agreement. So what are assets to, to have a more positive conclusion, if I may? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, uh, Mr. Gomara. What is your response? Do we have a positive future or the future is grim? No, I think, I think you know, quick reminder, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the European population was approximately 25% uh, of the global population. Now the EU population is 7% of the global population. So. That's normal, you know. There is this uh, this this question of size. So it's it's sure that our um, ability to to drive and to influence um, uh, won't be the same. So we have to be um, imaginative. We have to be uh, agile to to continue. In my view, it's possible to, to continue to, to be influential, you know, of the sense, the type of, of, uh, of globalization. We have, had, we have all the uh, uh, collective into intellectual and political capabilities, the channels to do so. So um, as, uh, as long as uh, we do want to do so, that's, that's, a, that's another issue. Um, now, what are the, the main uh, assets? Um, first of all, always uh, remind between ourselves, but also uh, externally, that's the European project, whatever its uh, defaults, uh, whatever the criticize we can, we can make and so on, produce peace since uh, 70 years for its members. So that's absolutely remarkable. Never, we should never forget that, and we should all the time start with that. Uh, the problem is that um, the, the generation, it's, it seems natural for the generation of students, it seems natural for my generation, for our generation, and it is not. Civis passem parabellum. If you want peace, people war. Uh, but it's a project which was able to produce 70 years of a peace for, for its member, and which is also a project which is based on a reconciliation between two historical enemies. Uh, third point, uh, yes, uh, Claire, you, you refer to the talents. I, th I think that's uh, certainly uh, something which is one of our main uh, assets. We should, in my view, invest, especially in the context of the sanitary crisis, but much more, and it's not because I'm speaking to, to students, I, I, I will say the same in other circumstances, but we should invest massively on our uh, youth, um, which can, which is very open-minded, very ready to, yes, to go to the world in positive terms. Uh, and that's, in my view, our main uh, assets. I think also, for, for type of asset, we have some capabilities to innovate, to invest, which are also uh, remarkable and which should be um, developed, but maybe which should be developed with a, a much more concern on or uh, on capabilities to be able also to to protect them more carefully that's all sets and uh, Ch the chinese do that the russian do that the us do that and europeans should be able to say no that's or you know for instance what we done in the space activities is remarkable and it should be continued 
but it's it's difficult. You, you need to to invest. You need passions. You need efforts. But we are um, uh, able, in my view, to to provide them. And um, last point, um, even if I was maybe um, I, I'm I, I'm quite critical about you know uh, this idea that. Uh, uh, our values, we insisted so often on our values, and we are more and more on the defensive sides uh, to, to, to defend them. I think that, you know, the ability to, to stay on systems based on separation of powers is, um, is certainly uh, a key uh, uh, factor of success, you know, in the future. So that's why I, I, I am not uh, at all um, pessimist, but uh, I try to be lucid. Thank you. So peace, freedom, uh, innovation, that's the key words why European Union is, will still matter. And, and defense. And, and defense, yes, security, I was about to say. So peace, uh, security, freedom, and innovation, these are the assets that European, uh, that European Union has and have to strengthen in order to be uh, to be uh, among the leading powers in the new world order. So I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Institut Francais, French Embassy, Monsieur Goma, merci beaucoup pour votre temps et pour la prochaine fois nous vous espérons à Vilnius. Acho labai visiems klaususiems, grožos vakar.